Hello to people that are joining. We're going to give it just another minute uh, so everyone that's in the waiting room can come in and we'll get started in just a minute. All right, I think we're going to just dive in so we can use the full hour. Um, thanks everyone for being here today. We have a really great webinar for you uh, talking about FSA loans uh, and the application uh, process with a farm loan manager. So before we get into content, just some Zoom housekeeping. Everyone is on mute right now uh, while we're doing the presentation. We'll have some time for Q&A at the end, at which point if you raise your hand, um, I can unmute you or I can, I can allow yourself to be unmuted and you could ask your question live. Um, we're also recording this webinar now and we'll send it to everyone that has registered. So um, you'll have that as a reference. And if you think of any questions, throughout um, the conversation, you can either you know, save it for the end, and like I said, you can um, ask it live, or there should also be uh, an option at the bottom of your screen for Q&A, and you can put any question that you have into that box, and we will save it for um, the last 10 minutes or so. All right, well, welcome again. Thank you for joining. Um, this webinar today is being offered by both the National Young Farmers Coalition and Rafi USA. Uh, Ebony, do you want to give a quick overview of um, Young Farmers? Sure. Um, Young Farmers is an intersectional coalition that works for justice and collective liberation of our food and farm systems. We champion policies that resource connections to the land and foster our health in the face of climate crisis. We also advocate for policies that recognize farming as a public service. We work with partnership with social justice movements for a future in which people, land, and relationships are respected. Thank and you. We also do a ton of, we, we do a ton of things. Um, I am the USDA Access and Accountability Organizer, um, and Shakira uh, and I work hand in hand. Um, working with farmers, uh, particularly BIPOC farmers, to walk them through the process of accessing FSA loans. Um, and so basically we hold their hand from the beginning uh, to the end. And so we're excited about this webinar because we want people to get to the end when they get that money uh, in hand. Right, Shakira? Awesome. Uh, and Rafi, USA, we about 30 year old um, nonprofit. We're based in North Carolina. Our mission is challenging root causes of um, injustice in the food system and advocating for sustainable, equitable, and just food systems. We do that through a number of different programs. Um, some of them I highlighted here are Farmers of Color Network, our Farmer Crisis Hotline, and Resources for Resilient <coughs> Farms, which is a program that tries to kind of break down um, USDA programs into like understandable and accessible resources so everyone can access those resources. And you can learn more about both these organizations at the websites below. Okay, and then who's on the call from Young Farmers and Rafi? Um, we've already heard from Ebony, also Shakira, and Otis uh, Wright was joining in a little bit. Uh, and our contact information is on the screen if you have any questions you'd like to ask us later. At this point, I'll turn it over to Shakira. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shakira Rigoza, and I am the FSA Technical Assistant for Young Farmers. And I'll be leading the conversation today. 
And we've already gone over some intros and in a little bit, I'll introduce our guest speaker, um, farm loan manager. Um, and then afterwards we'll have the Q and A, we'll get into some of the most frequently asked questions. And then at the end, we'll leave 10 minutes for your questions that you'll be putting in the chat, please add them to the Q and A below. So a little bit about Cecilia. Um, she's joining us from North Carolina and uh, she's been, um, she's gonna share her insights on how farmers can approach FSA loan applications. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the forms, the process and best practices. A little bit of background about FSA. We've done uh, webinars in the past with more details about the different programs. So we're just gonna give you a brief overview about FSA. It's a branch of USDA and the purpose of FSA is to support, um, give financial support to family farms. Um, they offer direct loans for buying land and also for your operating expenses. So in order to be eligible for these programs, farmers need to be actively participating in the farm. So either with labor or managing, um, and also you have to be farming for a profit. You also have to be over the years of 18 years or older, able to make your own financial decisions. Also, you um, must not have any convictions of growing um, controlled substances or, or any federal convictions. And you have to have a farm business plan or model and a good credit history. So some of the most popular programs that I've seen young farmers and beginning farmers uh, take advantage of are the microloan program, operating loans, and ownership loans. The microloans are loans under fifteen, or excuse me, under fifty thousand dollars, and the application process is a lot shorter than the bigger loans, and those are paid back within one to seven years. You can borrow fifty thousand for operating and fifty thousand for ownership and for a total of 100,000 altogether. There's operating loans also that are available for what you would think like uh, labor, for buying equipment, for seeds, fertilizers. Um, there's a long list there, uh, the uses for the operating loans and you can borrow up to 400,000 and those are paid back uh, between one and seven years as well, depending on what you're using the, the loan for. And lastly, ownership loans for purchasing land. These are also good for building infrastructure on your farm or, um, and for um, promoting soil and water conservation practices. And farmers can borrow up to 600,000 with these. And the terms uh, vary, but you can get a loan uh, up to 25 years on that. So that's just a really quick overview because we want to get into the questions, but you can find out more at farmers.gov slash loans. So uh, we're going to learn a little bit more about Cecilia Edge. She comes from North Carolina. She's been with FSA for 36 years. She began as a program technician in Tyrell County in May of 1987 and she was hired as a farm loan officer trainee in 2010. And in 2012, she became a farm loan officer in Martin Tyrell Dare in Washington counties. In February of this year, she became farm loan manager serving Beaufort, Hyde, Craven, Cataret, Martin, Pamlico, Tyrell Dare in Washington counties. So we're so happy to have her here because she's got a lot of experience that she's going to be sharing with us and give us some tips on how we should go about the loan process. So thank you, Cecilia, for being with us. Thank you, Shakira. Yes, glad to be here. So we have some questions for you. Um, and just to get some information about what is the process like for farmers not coming in, not knowing FSA, what should they expect? Can you please walk us through the typical uh, loan process. Okay, so um, the the loan application itself is um, is really informative. I really like the new application that has come out. 
Um, it's a one uh, form application. I mean, there's sev several pages to it, but um, the, the very first sheet that is um, on there is for the, the applicant himself. And it's got the, um, the information about the, the, the application and the loan information. Um, it tells you that within seven calendar days of the date that FSA receives their application, that um, FSA will send you a letter that will tell you if your application is complete. The reason why we do this is because um, if we don't have all the, um, the parts that we need to make a decision, then we kind of will move on to the next application if because it seems like at loan making time everybody is needing everything at one time i mean you're you're having annual operating loans you're having lenders to call you the loan officers are having lenders to call you to that need um to refinance um their debt or or something it seems like it's coming in all at one time so we would like to get the information and get it complete. So, but you've got seven days from the date that you, we've got seven days from the date that we accept your application to review it, to see if ever, that we've got everything that we need. If we don't, then we need to be emailing you or calling you or and sending you a letter that says that we need these particular things to finish up getting the things that we need for your application. Um, and it tells you that right on the front of this um, application. Another thing is the um, farmers.gov website. It's very, very detailed. And there's a, um, a quick guide to farm loans, the application quick guide. And it's for individuals. It's for entities. There's one for each individual thing. And I believe that Lisa's put this up on the um yeah, here we go. And it's got the loan process and what to expect on your farm loan journey. Um, and that's very informative. And like I said, that's on the farmers.gov website, a very good website. And you just click on loans and um, it's got the farm loan application um, or the application discovery tool and so much more information. Um, some of the things that happen outside the um, typical timeline, if it is a, a poultry operation or um, something that requires an environmental, um, those things sometimes do take a bit longer. We, um, we have to have that environmental um, in order to make a decision. We cannot make a decision subject to an environmental so we have to be getting um, the information that we need and that does take some time. So sometimes that could be something that holds us up, but we should be actually, the, the loan officer should be working on getting that, um, the information that they need to get that process, but they should be out visiting the farm. They should be keeping up with you and letting you know the process all along the way. Um, they shouldn't be just um, not be in contact with you. They should maintain that contact with you. Thank you, Cecilia. So from the complete application being submitted to the closing, how about how long does that take? Well, we, uh, we have 60 days to make a decision. The loan officer does. Um, we typically do, I, I know as a foreign loan manager and um i don't expect that our our farm loan officers of course wait that long it's just sometimes it takes that bit of time especially in the cases of if we have to have an environmental because you're dealing with so many other agencies um in an environmental situation if it's not an environmental situation if it's just a um a, a simple um a loan where it's on the land has previously been farmed um, or it's land that um, 
has been, you've had a garden on it, you've had, it's it's been in cultivation. Um, it's not going below the plow line or anything like that. It should, um, I would say when you say how long, as long as all the information, we have all the information that's required and that's on the last page of the application under the submission requirements. If that, if we have all the information that we have um, that we need for that application, then I would say it should not take any longer than two weeks. That's just, I'm gonna throw that out there. If it's a simple application, if it's not, you know, several crops involved, if it's, um, if it's difficult, like it's not your typical traditional crops and you're having to um, work with somebody that's looking up uh, pumpkins or some kind of non-traditional type crops and you're trying to work with them in, in obtaining data that is um, that there's a lack of data for, then that could take a little bit longer so it really just depends on a situation, in my opinion. Um, in the real world, you if you're starting out and it's, you're just doing a garden and you don't have any, you haven't had um, been keeping records um, and you don't know what kind of income and expense you've been, you know, what kind of income you've been getting and what kind of expense it's been. And we don't have any history of that then we got to got to build that. We got to come up and we got to figure out, okay, what's it going to take and where we're going to get these figures from. So we're going to have to work a little bit in trying to find those, you know, those figures. So it really depends. I'm not, but if it's, if it's something, if it's a traditional crop, I mean, it's two weeks, I'm saying it shouldn't take any longer than that. Well, thank I know you. that's a lot of information, but it just, it depends on the situation. Yeah. They have that 60 day time. That's the that the is suggest. that's right. And we'd like to have an eligibility decision. What the handbook says is we need to make an eligibility decision within 45 days. No, you know, if we if we haven't made an eligibility decision within 45 days, the national office, we have to explain why we haven't given them um why we haven't made an eligibility decision. But ultimately, as long as we give an explanation why we haven't made that decision, we actually do have 60 days. Good to know, thank you. Yes. So if farmers believe that they're not getting that communication or it's taking too long to process their application, what can they do? If they feel like that, if they're not, I mean, you know, if they feel like that they're not getting the attention that they they deserve, I mean, they, you know, reach out to the loan officer. And to me, you know, if they said that to me, I would do everything in my power to make sure I maintain contact with them because I would explain to them, you know, I am so sorry. You know, this is what's happened. This is what we've run into. But if if from that point on, they don't see some progression or anything happening, then I would call that farm loan officer and I'd say, you know, is there any way that I could speak to your supervisor or your district director and get their name and get their phone number? And I would contact them and say, look, I don't believe that um, the so-and-so, the farm loan officer is servicing my um, application in a timely manner. And I've feel like that I've submitted all the necessary documents and um, I'm not getting a response and just let them know. And if they want to file a formal complaint, they can file a formal complaint. That's right on the application itself. Um, it is on the last page, I believe, of the application. Excuse me, it's on the second to the last page. It's on page 11 of the application if they want to file a formal complaint of discrimination complaint. If they don't, if they just want to make an informal complaint, they could just call the district director, express that there is, you feel like there may be an issue and just call them and, and tell them. And I feel like that they would try to resolve the situation. All right, thank you. 
So we're talking about these new forms. In the past, FSA has had different forms for each program, you know, one for microloans, one for the operating ownership loans. So what's new with this, this new form? So all of the, um, the microloan, the operating loan, whether it's annual operating, whether it's a term operating loan, uh, farm ownership loan, um, whether it's your income and expense projection, whether it's your balance sheet, whether it's um, the application itself, they're all on the same form. It's all one interactive form um, that can that's fillable online, and um, it's it's a simple process. And I know when you first look at it, it can be overwhelming but you take it from the top, from the application itself, and um, it will tell you at the very top, at the beginning of the application, well, that first page right there on your screen, right there is the instructions. And that is the, that, that goes to the um, applicants themselves. So that says at the bottom, please keep this page for your records. So that is um, that you give to the to the applicant so that they can read over it, and that's where it, you know. So go to the next page, or the next one, yeah. So right here, Shakira, where it says right under where it's got request for direct loan assistance at the top, where it says direct request for direct loan assistance, it says instructions. FSA loan requests are to be submitted in the name of the operator of the farm. So the operator of the farm can be you as an individual in your name, or it could be that you as, if you're John Smith, it could be John Smith Farms Incorporated. And then it will tell you under um, just a little bit below that, operating as an individual, if you're operating as an individual, then you look right to the right of it. It'll tell you to complete parts B, E, F, G, H of this application. So if you're the primary applicant and the farm operator, you're going to complete parts B, E, F, G, but also you're going to complete this part A. So part A is going to be completed by whoever the farm operator is, however you report your crops, however you, whatever you're considered as whether you're an entity or an individual, and then you're going to complete those other parts. So then you're going to, if you're not an entity and you're just a primary, just an individual and you complete part B, then you're going to skip over and you're going to skip over part C and you're going to skip over part D and you're going to go to part E. And part E is going to have the loan request. And that's going to be where you're going to um, the use of the loan proceeds. Um, is it going to be a micro loan? Is it going to be a um, micro loan for annual operating? Is it going to be um, you need to purchase um, a tractor for and and a and a mower to pull behind the tractor, um, and the amount requested. So, use of proceeds. When it talks about use of proceeds, that's really important because if it is like the the purchase of what we call basic security, that's equipment equipment being the tractor and the mower in this example, that's an operating loan, but it is for, it's a term operating loan. So it can go between one and seven years. So, but if it is for seed and fertilizer, chemicals, um, labor, things that come, you have to pay for every year, that's going to be an annual operating loan. And that's going to be paid back within one year. So that's important. So if it's the um, the tractor and the mower, the amount requested, you would pay that within one to seven years. 
Normally, when as a loan officer, I'm going to allow seven years to make that payment the least it can be, unless you think, unless it's already really, really old and you feel like that your income and, and I could look at the income and expense or look at your projection and say, okay, do you want to pay it back in five years and get it off of you, you know, or you think you're going to need six years or seven years to pay it back? You know, let's look at this and see what you think, you know. Um, okay, so then we're going to have to complete part F, the training education experience, and then part G, we're going to have to check those, the, um, you're going to have to look over that, complete that, and then, let's see. Yes, and I think. Many farmers have questions about this next section, part H, yes. the balance sheet. How yes. does this cash flow worksheet um, work? Okay, the balance sheet is not your cash flow. The balance sheet is, okay, so it says right there on under part, it says, note, this part may be substituted. So if they've got another if they have written down this stuff on a notebook sheet of paper and they have listed everything that they own and everything that they owe on a separate sheet of paper, they could just check there and they can put the date that they did it. The balance sheet is as of this date. So what the balance sheet is, it's a balance. It's like a scale. It's like and you're hoping that an assets means everything you own. So everything you own, we're hoping is going to be way a whole lot more than everything you owe. So this scale, we're hoping it's going to be like this, <laughs> way down like this. You're going to hopefully owe a whole lot less. We're hopingly own a whole lot more. So what you're doing is you're listing everything you own and everything you owe. So, um, and what they do on this balance sheet is they list it by current assets and liabilities, intermediate assets and liabilities, and long-term. And they do that for the farm itself and for the personal. So you might have farm assets like equipment and um, you might have a separate farm account and then you might have a personal. So many times young farmers and um, yourselves even may run it through a checkbook and you, you only have one checkbook and you run it all together. Your, your family business, I mean, your family income and expense and your farming income and expense goes through the same checkbook. And I completely understand that, seen it. And a lot of times that that's exactly what happens. And so in that circumstance, then you could put it all up there in the, um, the current intermediate and long-term and just put it up there at the top where, do you see um, Shakira where it's got farm? You see it the farm and then you see come down about middle way, and then it's got personal? Yes, I see that. Okay, so if you like take a line and you draw it under that long-term liability, so if they only have one, um, one, let's just say checkbook or one set of records and they don't have two sets, like you don't, you only have, you run everything, you own everything as an individual, let's just say, then you could put it all under the personal or you could put it all under the farm. It really doesn't matter. Um, and you wouldn't have to fill out both. You would just oh, fill okay. out one. This, the farm and the personal is for the balance sheet. If you had personal assets that you yourself owned, as an individual, like you owned a farm in your, your own name, but let's just say you also farmed in um, jo John Smith Farms, Inc. And then, but the John Smith Farms, Inc. doesn't own the land, but John Smith does. 
So that's where it's kind of different. So the long-term farm asset would be um, in John Smith's name. It wouldn't be in the farm's name. And you would separate it and put the personal um, the personal asset as being John Smith under the personal for the for the land. And um, so that's where it's it's distinguished between the farm and the personal. So if it's like I said, if it's running all the same, if you have only one set as you're doing everything as an individual, just complete one section of that. And like a, um, also, like I'm saying, that is just a picture in time, the situation as of this date. That's why it's so important that at the top when it says balance sheet of and it's got as of a certain date. So it's a picture in time because things change. I mean, you know, it says cash and equivalents. You know yourself, your check, your balance and your checking account changes from day to day. So we're going to take it from this day and time. We're going to say, I've got this much in my account. I've got this much in the, I've got um, this much going, growing in, in the uh, fields. I've got this much stored in my bin or this much is in my cooler at this time. I've got this much crop in, that's stored for sale that I'm going to sell at the farmer's market in the cooler. Um I've got this equipment right now. I mean, it, those things, it's like a picture in time. It is what it is as of this particular date. So that's what the balance sheet is. Okay. So then the next section. And part of that balance sheet is continued. Um under the accounts receivables and the crop inventory, growing crops. Um, what it does is if you'll notice on the balance sheet itself on that, and I'm sorry, Shakira, I'm making you kind of go back to the where you were, <laughs> where you were to begin with um, on the balance sheet. You see where it says um, under current farm assets where it's got cash and equivalents and it's got schedule A beside it. Yes. And then it's, you see that? And then it says accounts receivable, schedule B and schedule C. See, when you're filling it online, you don't actually put the figure beside it here. You put it under the schedule A, C, and D down in those schedules down on the next page. And it gets populated? The, you put them there account. and then it populates it back up on the other page. That's correct. All right. So if you were to put that there, <clears throat> it's supposed to fill it up there. So it didn't, did it? Huh. I, I believe, I guess when you're on the online. Form. Yes, on the online one. Did you, let's see, did you, how did you, did you pull this from the form site or? This one might have come from the form site rather than the online tool. Yeah, I might have the wrong one here. But. Well, the farmer would could add that up himself, herself, and fill that in from the schedule. Correct. Okay. And if they just print it out, I, I mean, they don't have to fill it in twice. If they print it out, I wouldn't, I wouldn't fill it in twice. I mean. What I just I was just trying to explain that 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 that's what happens. So, you know, it may be confusing looking at it because it's like it's the same thing and they're asking for it twice. But that's what it's intended to do. And okay. I know I've done it before and it's that's what it does. It populates on the first on the. um On page that page four from the schedule that you're putting it in on on page five yeah okay. so i'm sorry we didn't we couldn't show it here but it might be just from the, yeah we should have checked that we should have tested that one out i'm so sorry we didn't do that i apologize no well, no problem we, we have the idea so farmers know there's okay. two ways of doing it okay yeah okay um 
but like I said, if you didn't want to do it on this particular one, if you're if your your operation is simplified, then you could do it on your own sheet sheet of paper, and then all you would do would be to um, check that one block on that page for check here if you're submitting alternate documents, and then it says then proceed to part I. So then part I would be the um, cash flow, I believe. Yes, this is so that's correct. So the cash flow projection is what you are going to project in the year. Um, so at this point, um, if somebody came in to do a farm loan that you know was applying now um, in June, um, depending on when they what they needed the money for would be if they need I mean at this point probably they're not going to be applying for annual operating for um 2023 if they were applying for a loan it might be for a piece of equipment if it was for a piece of equipment I may still do a projection for 2023 um because they haven't begun harvest and it's still quite early in the growing season. I mean, a lot of the farmers have their crops up and growing. Um, the gar the the big planted gardens and the um some of the greenhouses are growing and they're not going to be selling the produce for a little while. So um I probably would do a projection for 23 at this point. But if it's something that's already planted, yeah, we could consider the growing growing crops in their balance sheet and we could um, do the projection based on what they've got out there now. So you're going to have the production cycle start date would be this year if we're going to do for for 2023, we're going to do 1123 to 123. Suppose, you know, let's just say. And then your crop production would be whatever your your enterprise is. If it's organic pro, if it's produce, if it's corn and soybeans and wheat, if it's, you know, whatever. And then if it's livestock, you'd put that. If it's oysters, you'd put that. I believe you me, I've had I have oysters. We have mushrooms. I just went out to a mushroom farm this last week. Um, let's see. And you would put the number of acres. So you would put under crop production, you would put your whatever it is that you're planning. And your unit of measure, if it's pounds, if it's bushels, um, the number of acres, if it's not acres, then you would need to have some kind of unit um, of a way of determining if it's two rows, how long are the rows, uh, some way of determining and coming up with, uh, uh, because you're gonna need to report that those crops, no matter what it is. The farmer needs to report that crop. Um, okay, so then you establish all that. And then under other farm income, if you've got a tractor and you're mowing for somebody else and you get custom hire income, you would put that there. Um, and then it has non-farm income. That would be if you have any um, uh, off the farm job somewhere that you earn in wages and you would put that income there. We ask that because in the cash flow, we like to look and make sure, you know, is the farm gonna have to to um to fund your 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 family living, or is is there non-farm income coming into the household that's gonna be able to um fund the family living costs, electric bill, food, and all that type of thing. So we like to see that. And that's quite often why we like to see at least um, if it's a microloan, one year of tax returns. And if it's not a microloan, if it's uh, over 50,000, why we want to see three years um, tax returns. 
So, and then um, here's your operating plan expenses. So above where we had the, the, the crop um, acres and all, the, we're gonna calculate your income because how we come up with income is going to be based on if you've got a history, a yield history, we're going to get that from crop insurance if you've had crop insurance or if you've had NAP insurance, then we're going to get the NAP history that you've um, or you've applied for, for NAP for that. Um, if it's neither of those and you don't have um, a record of any kind of yield then that's where we're going to have to look into, okay, what kind of um, data do we need to know? What can we expect? And if you've ever um, produced that crop and, but just didn't have records, but you have a record of, or, uh, or knowledge of what kind of income it produced, we may could do it off based on income. <clears throat> like if you had a garden or an area where you produced cabbage, collards, um, broccoli, squash, and you sold it at a roadside market or a farmer's market and, um, and you went to the farmer's market in Raleigh and bought some stuff and then sold it, resold it. You need to keep the most important thing to know is to keep those records and uh, keep a record of what you're you're buying and what you're producing and what you're selling. Keep the records of how much it is and um, so that we'll know when you come in to to do a loan um, how to do a projection. Um, if you're going to start out for the first year and this is the first year you've done it and you don't have any records what I'd say is let's just start off, start off sm small and just record keeping is going to be the key thing. Just start off small um, and then maintain those records. And um, we'll see if we can come up with the data for you to put in there for your yield and the per unit cost. We'll have to come up with, we'll have to work with cooperative extension service or with whatever data we can come up with to estimate, um, um, but that is, you know, that's that's difficult because there's there's the lack of data. It's 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 very difficult to come up with. Um, loan officers become, you know, frustrated as well as the producer because they don't have the data. The producer doesn't. You probably don't, and and we don't. I mean, it's it's like there if there's not if the data is not available, it's not like we can just produce it. So it's important that if you ever do um, any kind of uh, roadside markets um, or farmer's market that you maintain records so that we can establish a history uh, for those for that particular crop or produce or whatever. So, okay. So now we've got the income and then you've got to have the expense. So if you don't have the expense itemized, like on a Schedule F of a um, income tax, then if you've got it lumped under, okay, my expenses were $3,000 or $3,500 this year, my income was 5,000. You know, if, we, if you have something to show that, you know, that I, uh, it costs, I made about 5,000, it cost me 3,500. So I made $1,500. Report that on your income taxes. If you're not gonna report it on your income taxes and you're not gonna keep the records, uh, it's gonna be difficult for us to be able to continue to do a loan um, without having those records. So just, just saying, just gonna put it out there. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Um, let's see, other expenses, sometimes, um, if you have to purchase a, um, a piece of equipment or anything if in that particular year, that's where you're going to put that amount in there. If you have to rent the land, that's very important that we know who, you know, 
who the owner is and how much you um, have to pay the rent, you know, how much you have to pay them rent for, especially if it's an annual operating, because um, that's going to go, that's going to be a particular expense for annual operating. Well, for, even for um, operating, term operating, it's an expense that we've got to expense on your cash flow. So that's where those items will go on that. And then you go on down and there's some structure. Cecilia, can yes. we switch? I think we're going to get there, but what are some documentation that they will request? I know you've talked about um, Schedule Fs. What are some other things that farmers have to bring into the office? Um, okay. So to what for the application? Yes, besides the application, do they need to submit any records for their business? Um, any other documentation they have to present? Um, for a complete application, all of that is on the, the, the submission requirements that are on page 12 of the application. That's yes. Okay. So if you'll see, it says instructions right there on the back. It says the items below are required for a complete application. Okay, so the first thing, it says most recent three years of financial records. And you'll see I keep on looking up because my camera's right here, but my, the form's up here on my screen and my screen won't project it down here, so I have no idea. But anyway, that's why I keep on looking up. But um, most recent three years of financial records and it says tax returns, including all form schedules or similar. So for microloans, it's only one year. So if it's under 50,000, then you would only have to bring in one year. For this is the other, so this is another record, the production record, um, three years of production records. So if you have produced that crop, and if you've got the record of production, I mean, most people that produce the traditional crops, corn, peanuts, soybeans, wheat, whatever, the traditional row crops, they're going to have crop insurance of some sort. So we they can bring in the information they get from crop insurance, and it has the production records or their yields. And so that would be if they have their production records, what they actually produced um, in those years, how much they produced, um, that's the other thing that we need. So for um, microloans, it's only one year that we would need it for, and it's three years for the other. And then two most recent pay stubs for non-farm income or other proof of non-farm income. A W-2 is a other form of non-farm income. And so let's just say that the husband is farming full-time, but the wife is the one supplying the non-farm income. If you want to say that she's providing family living, then we'll need her to, to check stubs. And then we'll just exclude her and her income from the from the cash flow. We won't we'll exclude the owner withdrawal or their family living as long as we can verify with those check stubs that her income is sufficient to pay the family living for um for a family of, you know, whatever, if they're a young farmer and they've got two kids and the two of them, the husband and wife, or whatever the situation may be, that we determine if they've got enough non-farm income to cover that, then we can exclude it from the cash flow. So then it'll tell you um, we're going to have to have the credit report fee um, if it's an individual, so it's $16. And I usually wait and collect that just to make sure that we're going to go through the whole loan process. I don't want to charge somebody something if it's not going to go through. So, but um, most of the time um, they don't mind paying it and they go ahead and, and do it. Um, and they want to know what their credit's going to look like, you know, some of them. And so they'll say, well, no, I'll go ahead and pay it. And you know, well, let's go ahead and look at it and I'll go ahead and do it and we'll look at it right then. So, but I tell them, I, you know, you don't have to pay it until later if you don't want to. Okay, the 1026, that is a um, a wetland and not and a highly erodible, it's an environmental type form. 
that normally the county office gets if you're signed up into some of their county program uh, programs. And so if the, they are signed up in the county office programs, then I can get a copy of that from the county office, uh, FSA office. If not, then they'll need to fill that form out. And that is simply if they are farming on land, whether it's had a determination um, and we look at the map and see where their farming operation is and determine whether it's ever had a determination of a highly erodible land and wetland um, determination. So that's what that 1026 is. Um, okay. Well, sorry, I don't want to cut you off, but I do no. want to leave some time for questions. Yep. Uh, but this form is available on farmers.gov and you can see what other documents you need for your specific farm, but those are the most important ones. So it's very important for farmers to keep those records. Um, so we have 10 minutes left and we wanna make sure we get your questions answered. So I'm gonna let Lisa um, open up the Q&A and we can ask those questions. Great, uh, yes, yeah, so and we have some questions already. Uh, you can add more to the Q&A box or like I said, you can raise your hand if you want to ask a question live. Um, so there is a question about credit scores. Um, They'd like to know if there's any consideration taken if it's a recent credit issue uh, due to health reasons. Um, someone said my credit was good until this year. There's considerations, yes. Um, what we're instructed to do is actually if we, I don't look, we don't act actually look at the credit scores. I mean, the scores are on there. I'm sure we're all human. We see them, but we I could, we, what we're instructed to do is look at the history of does this, does this person have a history of bad credit? Does it have, you know, is there a repeated, repeated, repeated um, history of bad credit? And so what, what we are instructed to do is to meet with a person if we see some items of concern and we figure out what is the issue. If it's medical, then we work with them and we determine, okay, if it is recent, okay, what happened? And is this something that is gonna be, um, are they gonna be able to set up, up a payment plan? Have they set up a payment plan? What is the payment plan? So we do work with them. There is not a situation where where we just say, no, well, you're, you're out. No, we don't do that. Okay. That's absolutely not acceptable. We do work with them. Great. Um, the next question is uh, someone specifically asking about um, who a loan, loan officer is in their county, Guilford County, um, said I've contacted a few people, no one seems to know who the loan officer is, this is my third year as registered producer, I've been working the process for two years, and this is, yes, Guilford County. Um, so, okay, okay, so let, let me make sure I understand the question, so Guilford County, so you're you're in Guilford County and you are unable to determine who the loan officer is that you need to work with. Is that the question? Uh, th yes, that's what it seems like. OK, uh, I can I can certainly find that out in in a matter of a few minutes. <laughs> I should be able to find that out in a matter of just a few minutes. Um, Yep. What's the next one? Yeah, we can we can follow up on that. Um, yep. All right. Yep. So then there's a question. There's a couple questions about the three year requirement. Um, someone asking for clarification on new farmers and what the three year requirement looks like. Um, later on, let's see. There was a question. Um, someone else asked. So if we have less than three years of operation, are we not eligible? So maybe some clarification around that. Okay, the only three year requirement that I'm aware of is there there was in the handbook um, three out of 10 years uh, managerial experience for farm ownership um, loans. So what um, what it says, but there's been a lot of exceptions or what they've done is they have um, added um not exceptions but they've added that oh i can't remember i can't think of the exact terminology in the handbook but it's 
if you have this and this, you can get a, a, a year that's determined. I mean, that you can get a year of um, that's considered one year of um, eligibility of the one of three. And then if you have this, you can get two out of the three. And then if you have this and this, you can get all three. So like if you were a veteran with with um, any management experience as a veteran, then you could get one year um, as of experience management, um, managerial experience. But like I'm saying, from what I'm understanding, and I'm hoping the question was asked based on the requirements of the farm ownership loan. And was that the question that was asked? Was that? Uh, it does not clarify if it was ownership or operating. Um, yeah, because the operating, it does not, there is no three year, there's no three year requirement that you have to be in operations for three years. And it's really not a requirement that you have to be in operations for three years for um, for farm ownership. There, that has changed in the last two years. There's been, um, that has got to seriously be looked at by a farm loan officer, everybody's circumstances or situations. And that has to be looked at with the, um, with the applicant. Um, to see if they meet those um, exceptions or those whatever's that I can't think of. <laughs> no worries. Uh, okay, we might have time for two more questions. Um, so apologies if we don't get to your question, maybe we can follow up and um, when we send out the recording. Um, so I'll do one in the Q&A and then I see Mara has raised her hand. So in the Q&A, question about my FSA office requires me to be declined by another lender before I apply to FSA. That's absurd. Is this a consistent policy? No, that is in, that is not consistent. The only time that you are required to get that is if it's an emergency loan. You do not have to have it unless you have to have, you do have to have that only in the case of an emergency loan. If it's an operating loan or if it's a farm ownership loan or micro loan for either one, you do not have to have a lender turned down. And in that situation, if they're requiring that, then they're going against procedure. And that's when I would ask for um, um, their supervisor's name and phone number. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So, Maura, I've allowed you to unmute yourself if you want to ask your question. Thank you. Um, I was one of the people that asked about the three years of operation. So on the form, it says, you know, to attach your like latest three years of records. Um, as a new farmer, I obviously wouldn't have three years of records. And so that's kind of the source of my question there is if I don't have three years of records to attach in response to those questions that are looking for like three years of operating records is the one year or two years that I have sufficient or is that going to end up getting my application rejected are you okay are you talking about under the submission requirements on the application I think so it was on one of the farm one of the pages of the form just before we switched to Q&A yes. okay so that was the submission requirements where it's got most recent three years of financial records and most recent three years of production records? Yes. So that like, for example, if I only have a year of production records because I've oh. only been in operation for a year, is that going to be? No, like, no, no, no. That's not a game changer. Kickback? Absolutely okay. not. It's not a game changer at all. No, we have, we, we absolutely not. You would, um, you would still be considered. Yes, you were, you're fine. I mean, you're a beginning farmer, so you wouldn't have it. So, but, but yeah, you do not have to have it unless you have been farming for that long for an operating loan or a, a term loan or maybe even a farm ownership loan. It just depends on your situation. Okay. Thank right. you. Thank Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Just to get some feedback from y'all, I've just launched a evaluation poll. If you have a few minutes, please just um, fill that out before you hop off um, to let us know how we did. Um, there, while you're looking at that, um, you know, I'll, I'll mention again, we have, um, well, we've recorded this um, webinar and we'll send out the recording probably in a few days. Um, let me also share my screen so you can see 
Um, let's see. If you if you would like any technical assistance with you know putting together a loan, um, like Ebony said at the beginning, um, National Young Farmers is able to help you you know work through a loan as well as Raffi. Um, so we have Shakira and Otis's um, phone numbers and emails on the screen if you'd like to reach out and talk more about you know anything that was covered today um, or you know what you would like your loan um, application process to look like, and hopefully we can help you out. Um, Shakira and Ebony, anything else you'd like to mention? Yes, you me okay? Yes. Awesome. Um, I I would just like to uh, thank everyone uh, for coming on. Um, in addition, if you require technical assistance um, around your farm loan application, or you feel like during this process, whether getting your phone number, I said phone number, <laughs> getting your farm number, <laughs> um, <laughs> or, you know, uh, feel like you face some discrimination in the process, uh, do feel free to reach out to us. That is something uh, that we do provide TA on working with BIPOC farmers who have experienced discrimination um, on whatever level. So uh, we like to hear your story. So if that's something that you have experienced, please feel free to reach out to Shakira or Otis uh, so that we can talk about next steps with you as well. Um, and Shakira, um, am I still on? Yes, you are. Okay. Um, the for the person that um, for Guilford County, I do have a name and a number. Um, it's Sterling Noir Four, and it's but the first name is Sterling, and the phone number is three three six four nine six three nine four two. And I just put that in the chat as well. And the, okay, and then the that's he's a farm loan officer. The manager is Sonny Este. And I don't let's see, I don't have a hmm. Yes, I do have a phone number. And it's 704-872-5555. Great. Okay, well, I'll close the poll and um, yeah, I think that brings us to the end of our webinar today. Um, Cecilia, thank you so much for joining okay. and sharing this information. Um, I hope folks that joined found it helpful. Um, and again, consider us a resource um, if there's any additional questions. And, and thank you Shakira for um, moderating. Yes, thank you all. Thank you Shakira, all right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.